such a great cook in the rain breakfast. So I've decided a few years ago, Tom and I participated in an oral history project at Georgia State University. And um, those interviews took like four or five hours. So I knew I was in trouble to do 20 minutes. But what I've done is I'm going to highlight a few themes. The themes are I am Canadian, music, math, food, and activism. And maybe I'll get to all of those. So I am Canadian. Born in Canada, a U.S. citizen's parents. Most Americans think Canadians are just like Americans, except maybe a little bit nicer. And years ago, there was a competition in Canada. They said, in the States, they say American is apple pie. What do we say in Canada? And the winner was, as Canadian as possible, given the circumstances. Yes, I have dual citizenship. Um, three of my four grandparents came from large, extended German-American families. My father's dad was born in Wales. We assumed we were 75% German and 25% Welsh. Lo and behold, my brother's DNA showed we're about two-thirds German and one-third Scots, Welsh, Irish. So evidently, another one of those not too far back German ancestors married a Welsh or Scots or Irish person. So now on to music. My sister, who was seven years older, took piano lessons and played beautifully. As a toddler, I tried valiantly to play along. She taught me chopsticks. Finally, at age five, my parents gave in to my demand and uh, signed me up for piano lessons. I continued through age 10, and if any of you know the Toronto Conservatory of Music, I achieved grade three in performance and grade eight in theory. However, I quit. My lessons interfered with my social calendar. The following year in sixth grade, I joined the violin orchestra at my elementary school and launched my effort to learn to play. You can imagine that conversation with my parents. I just quit piano, now I wanna take violin. Um, but I, and I didn't take uh, private lessons. I only took lessons with the uh, violin orchestra. That at the end of that year, which was my first year and the group's second year, we won the Toronto wide competition, which was wonderful. Um, that year, I also joined the school choir. Meanwhile, my older sister and I tortured our father by singing hillbilly music around the house, such as the Everly Brothers. We could sing the tight harmonies that were the Everly Brothers signature. Bye bye love, bye bye sweet caress, hello emptiness, I think I'm gonna cry, bye bye my love, goodbye. Um, our extremely open-minded dad was biased when it came to hillbillies. And that's probably why I married a son of West Virginia. We moved to Rochester when I was starting high school and I played in the East High School Orchestra and in the Inner High Orchestra. I was terrible about practicing, but had enough innate talent to do reasonably well. Some of the most fun I had was playing in the Pitt Orchestra for musical theater performances at East High. We really kibitz the uh, sax player's brother who had to kiss the girl. That was fun. I didn't pursue any music in college other than becoming a regular folk dancer. In 1995, when Tom and I and our family moved to Rochester, I joined the choir and have been singing ever since. I also did some musical theater, which made me wonder why I had never tried that in high school or subsequently. Okay, 
So that's about music. Now I'm going to turn to math. And many of you know that music and math abilities are highly correlated. Something about how our brain works, I guess. From an early age, numbers and patterns just made sense to me. As a five-year-old, I would compute in my head the change my mom was going to get from the clerk. Those clerks were never happy to be corrected by a little kid. I was good at math all through school. In high school, when the, count, when the counselor met with me to discuss future direction, she unimaginatively told me I could be a bookkeeper or maybe a math teacher. My male colleagues were being sent on to be physicists, mathematicians, and engineers. I will always wonder how my life might have been different if an imaginative school counselor and had inspired me to be a mathematician. As a result of the messages I received, I avoided the STEM fields in college, majoring in anthropology and archaeology instead. Eventually, I went back to school part-time and got my MBA with a focus on finance. I worked in financial planning and analysis from then on. My writing ability that was nurtured in college and in my years at the Great Speckled Bird served me well in communicating financial information. At first Unitarian, I was determined not to get involved in financial matters. Eventually, I stepped up to be treasurer. I did a lot of cleanup to make sense of our accounting and to increase transparency. However, I was absolutely delighted to turn it over <coughs> to Robert Lubomirsky last year. And by the way, he did a fabulous presentation the other day on Zoom about our new treasurer's report. And presumably we will have a face-to-face -face version of that sometime in the future. Now to food. My paternal grandmother lived with us from Thanksgiving to Easter when I was a child, and she taught me to bake. For some perspective, she died when I was six and a half. My father made it clear that I was expected to bake the traditional family Christmas cookies from then on. My other grandmother didn't allow anyone else in the kitchen, which resulted in my mom not knowing how to cook when she got married. Mom could not fry an egg to my liking, which motivated me to learn to cook. I had an insight when I was about 10 that when I made tasty cookies, cakes and brownies, I got praise. And did that ever feel good? When I was in my tween years, it bothered me whenever we had guests for dinner, which was fairly often, my father regaled them in the living room while my mom was stuck in the kitchen. That uh, did not seem fair to me. So I started kicking her out of the kitchen and finishing making the dinner. For three summers when I was 13 to 15 years old, my mother took a three-week course during blueberry season, and each of those summers I made 30 blueberry pies at our summer cottage on Cashbog Lake <coughs> in Ontario, Canada. That's the absolute best way to learn how to bake pies, by the way. I also cooked all the meals for my dad and various guests who arrived on the weekends. In college, at age 17, I made my first Thanksgiving dinner, everything from scratch. That may have been the last time I made absolutely everything from scratch, um, but there were about 10 of us students having Thanksgiving that year. I continued expanding my repertoire in Atlanta, where I first learned about vegetarian meals, 
Later, I tried things like Mexican and Indian. With our sons mostly grown, I really started becoming a foodie. Some of my motivations. I think I'm one of the 25% of us who are quote unquote super tasters. As I have an acute sense of taste and smell and can't toler tolerate bitter things like cooked greens. I'm also allergic to a bunch of foods, tomato, eggplant, all the melons and squashes. Most of what I'm allergic to originated in the Western Hemisphere. So I think I'm supposed to be a European, really. Anyway, you'll never see melon in my mixed fruit. Instead, I add mango and papaya. I'm also fearless in the kitchen, as some of you have noticed. That means I can cook for two or for 300. I'm also, I think, pretty good at managing a kitchen and can teach volunteers to do whatever I need them to do. Since my teens, I, people have told me I should have my own restaurant or bakery. My answer to that is it would make it too much like work. So now I am going to talk about activism. My dad was an activist Unitarian minister whose Toronto Sunday services were on the newspaper City Beat. Some of the reporters actually joined the church. Civil rights, human rights, anti-censorship, homelessness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Toronto church sponsored a Hungarian refugee family in the mid-1950s. Our family lived in a house owned by the church known as a parsonage. The Hungarians lived on our second floor for a year. That just highlights one of the things about a, being a minister's kid and the time when we had parsonages. It wasn't our space alone. It was also the church's space. My first protest march was at the Rochester Theater that was showing Elmer Gantry in 1960. I think it was a Lowe's Theater the theater chain was segregated in the South. In 1962 or 1963, I participated in Youth Sunday by doing a sermon at, entitled Why Red China Should Be in the United Nations. Now, today we call it China or the People's Republic of China, but back then we called it Red China. In 1963, I desperately wanted to go to the big march on Washington, but was instead on, on my way across Canada by train to Portland, Oregon to attend Reed College. During college, I remember a march protesting the House Un-American Activities Committee's hearing in Portland. It was also a tongue-in-cheek beatniks for Goldwater march. Berkeley sit-ins, anti-war movement, and on and on. In Washington, D.C. in 1967 to 68, the anti-Vietnam War movement was in full swing. I was a student fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies, working with Arthur Wasco, who later became a radical rabbi an editor of a magazine called Tikkun. Everyone I knew went to the march on the Pentagon. The idea was we were going to levitate the building, but um, that didn't quite happen. One of my housemates was a founder of Liberation News Service that supported the underground press. Another housemate was arrested for draft dodging. He was a conscientious objector. I got to know many civil rights activists during that year, mostly Southerners. Key among them, Clifford and Virginia Durr from Montgomery, Alabama. Clifford, Clifford was a lawyer, a precursor to today's Brian Stevenson, defending black people in Alabama in the 1930s through 1950s or longer. 
Virginia was a leader in ending the poll tax in Alabama. They were friends of Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt, and Clifford was appointed to the Federal Communications Commission. He was there when the decisions were made about how to do color TV. You can ask me about that sometime. In Atlanta, I was involved, well, I should say, after my year in Washington, I moved to Atlanta. And I was involved in civil rights, anti-war, women's movement. As an activist journalist with The Great Speckled Bird, which was named by Mike Wallace of 60 Minutes as the Wall Street Journal of the Underground Press. Some of you have watched the um, video on Google of that interview that included myself and Mike Wallace and a couple other of the folks from The Bird. During that time, I also worked for the ACLU Southern Region. At the time, they were representing Muhammad Ali in his draft case, a Green Beret doctor who resisted orders to train people to treat soldiers affected by Agent Orange, and the National Democratic Party of Alabama that protested the George Wallace Party at the 1968 Democratic National Convention. That was the year that I didn't have Christmas or New Year's because that case had to make it all the way through the Supreme Court before the president was inaugurated in January. During that time, I was organizer for an anti-war, anti-Nixon march, where I learned a lot about collaboration with many different groups. And I was also a supporter of some union organizing efforts. As a side note, we on The Great Speckled Bird could not find a printer who would print The Great Speckled Bird in Atlanta. We found a printer in Montgomery, Alabama. And by the way, it's not Montgomery, it's Montgomery. Um, every Thursday morning, we would drive a rental truck to the printer with the camera ready copy. Later that day, we would pick up 15 to 20,000 copies and return to Atlanta. When I went on those printer runs, I would spend the day with Virginia and Clifford Durr. Virginia was a mentor. In 1970, I joined the Venceremos Brigade for a trip to Cuba, where me and 400 of my very best friends from all over the US, excuse me, did our best not to destroy the Cuban citrus industry. We also met with revolutionaries from many parts of the world, including North Vietnam. This was how I met Tom Perry. Other notables on that brigade were Roxanne Dunbar, now Ortiz, and Angela Davis's sister. Also in Atlanta, we got involved in the Southern Bicycle League, encouraging alternatives to automobile transportation, advocating for bike routes, doing a lot of bicycling and organizing bike races. Another aspect in Atlanta was I got involved with organizing the U.S.-China People's Friendship Association's Southern Region. Our principal demand was diplomatic relations between the U.S. and the People's Republic of China. I went to China on a friendship tour in 1974. I went back in 1976 as a representative of the Southern Region to plan the 1977 tour program. When our meetings were over, we joined a regular friendship tour. My roommate on that tour was Maggie Kuhn of the Grey Panther Party. Another well-known tour member was Wallace Muhammad. And uh, he was clearly someone who very truly embraced the Muslim faith.
As a result of that trip, I was hired to run the tour program for U.S.-China People's Friendship Association, and we moved to Los Angeles. After thinking Atlanta was too big, we moved to Los Angeles. I ran that tour program from 1977 through 1980, and we sent about 10,000 Americans on tours to China during that time. I enjoyed the business aspects of that, so I went back to school for my MBA. And a few years later, we adopted our two sons through the Los Angeles County Social Services. We put our activist energy into raising Anthony, who was four when we adopted him, and Gary, who was seven when we adopted him. 